good story there are subplots that weave their way around the main storyline. These subplots can tell a story unto themselves, or they might add to your understanding of the main point or focus of the whole story. Well, during our last Sunday sermon broadcast, we began a story of a man of God who was guided by the Holy Spirit to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah was a man who was well organized. He began to work on the walls by dividing up each section and gate to various individuals and families. But as you may recall, Dr. McGee shared with us about a story within the story, that is, the gospel in the gates of Jerusalem. Well, today we'll continue our trip around the wall of Jerusalem and gain an understanding of how each gate has a message and a principle that God has given us to live this Christian life. For 21 years, Dr. McGee served as the pastor of the historic Church of the Open Door in downtown Los Angeles, and it was at that time that he first gave this sermon. Now, before we come to our study, I have a few letters that I'd like to share with you. This first one's from a listener in San Leandro, California, who writes, I turned my life over to Christ in 1999 and began to listen to Through the Bible shortly after that. I thank God every day for the Bible bus. I'm fortunate that my church in Castro Valley, California, offers many classes for baby Christians, and they're wonderful. But I must say that J. Vernon McGee has taught me the most. I will never stop thanking God for using him. I was raised a Catholic in an alcoholic home. I grew up mostly on my own. I began to do drugs in the fifth grade and dropped out of school at 14. My life was empty and dead at 36 years old. I had two boys, 7 and 11. My second marriage was over, and I had no job, and I was very scared. But in my mind's eye, I saw Jesus with his arms open wide. I am 42 now. My Lord made paths straight. I never turned back to drugs. I am part owner of a successful beauty salon. My boys are 16 and 13. They do well in school, thank God. I put the Lord first now. I never stop seeking him. Because I am alive now, he truly snatched me from death. I love the Bible, bus. Thank you. Keep it rolling. This next letter comes from a listener in Napa, California, and she says, I just want to express my deep appreciation for the ministry of Dr. McGee. I was for many years in a fellowship that I thought was right, but I realize now that it is a cult. I always felt depressed, unsure of God's love for me, unsure of my salvation, unsure of God's forgiveness. I could go on and on. Four years ago, I came across Dr. McGee's program. I was doing this secretly, as listening to Christian radio would be frowned upon in the fellowship I was in. I was thrilled with what I heard from Dr. McGee. I especially enjoyed the hymn sung at the end of the program, Jesus Paid It All. The only salvation I knew was enduring to the end, and maybe you can be saved. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now here's a letter. This is from another woman with a similar story. She's from Aberdeen, Washington, and writes to us, I have wanted to write for so long. I've been listening for about three years now. My folks and my husband's folks also listened. As I began to listen, I realized that I was in a cult, a church that believed that they are the only way and that if you don't go to this church, you will go to hell. As I began to listen to J. Vernon teach from each book of the Bible as well as each verse, I realized that I did not have the truth. The emphasis was not on Jesus dying on the cross, but on this church being the only way. I'm so grateful for J. Vernon's clear picture of the teachings of Jesus and that he is the only way and that we must accept him as our Savior for salvation. I left the cult in October. My husband is still a part of it. Please pray for him. He has leukemia and has a short time to live. The cult lets it be known that anyone who leaves has mental problems. I have such peace, and it is such a comfort to hear J. Vernon each day at 1 p.m. Thank you for continuing his teachings. Well, our next letter is from a listener in New York City who says, First, I want to thank Dr. J. Vernon McGee and the morning sermons. I was born a Muslim but never felt in my heart that that was the way. 
Even as a little boy, a family friend took us to church. My sister was saved and said many prayers for me until I too was saved. Jesus is the only way, and I have learned more and more from Dr. McGee. My family still finds it difficult to accept my belief in Christ, but my only care is the belief in Christ and my salvation. Thank you so much, through the Bible and Dr. McGee, because my days are blessed every morning I listen. We come now to this letter from a listener in Youngstown, Ohio, who's experienced a real change in his life, and he writes to us, I first heard your program in 1988 and began listening in earnest. I was 27 years old at the time in the United States Navy and had a ready-made family. After a few weeks, I fell on my knees and asked the Lord to forgive me and accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I started attending church, and my life was turning for the better. Then I had to tell the truth for a terrible thing I had done in the past, and I fell terribly for the next 18 months. It was in December 2006 that my mother invited me to the Christmas Eve service at the hometown church, a church I had not been in since I was four or five years old. It was about the same time that I turned the dial on the radio and found your radio ministry again as well. I've been attending church with my mother ever since and have been listening to your broadcast via Internet. Praise be to God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord, and may God richly bless you. Finally, we also have this wonderful letter. This is from a listener in Wayne, Michigan, who says, Thank you for what you've done at Through the Bible. I was lost and living in sin when I found your broadcast by mistake. I now know it was the Lord Jesus Christ that directed me to you. The living Word of God is changing my life. I've had many tears of joy and sadness while listening to Dr. McGee. I know through it all it is Jesus in my life. Thank you, and keep doing the Lord's work. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you provide to us a greater understanding of who you are, even in such seemingly insignificant things as the gates of Jerusalem. Fill us now with a longing to see Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. I want to read only two or three verses that will get us back into this story of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. And I go back to verse 17 of chapter 2, where Nehemiah has made a trip from Shushan the palace. He's taken a leave of absence as a layman, and without telling anybody about it, he's made a survey of the walls of Jerusalem, and he sees that the condition is much worse than he anticipated. And so here is what he did. Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. They said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Now, this man Nehemiah then organized these people in one of the greatest building, rebuilding programs that you have ever seen. He did it in a very unique fashion. In order to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, he assigned a certain section along the wall to individuals, sometimes to groups, sometimes to families, sometimes to individuals. And they were to, to rebuild that particular part so that when the wall went up in one spot, it went up all the way around. And when the wall was completed in one place, it was completed all the way around. Now, we began with Nehemiah in a walk around the walls of Jerusalem. We went with him from gate to gate, for he gives us the ten gates. And we didn't want to tire you out, so we only took five gates. And I hope that you are rested up and you're able to make the other five gates. We began at the sheep gate. And we saw that the sheep gate speaks of the cross of Christ. We went from the sheep gate to the fish gate, and we found out that the fish gate speaks to our hearts, that the Lord Jesus said to those that are his own, I will make you fishers of man. 
Then we went by the old gate, and we saw that that's God calling us back to the old way. We live in a day when we want everything that's new, and that's the thing that's causing so much of our tension today, so much of our disturbance, so much of our dissatisfaction. And so we need now the latest thing. And as a result, we are disturbed and wondering how we're going to be able to make the payments not only on the one for next year, but the one that we bought last year. And we're still having our problem. Well, may I say to you, God says to us, ask for the old path. That's what Jeremiah said. We need to get back. Many of us need to get back to the days actually before we looked at TV. Uh, in the days when we had, uh, many of us, much higher principles in the day when we had great uh, values set for our own lives and for our own characters. But we've seen all of that whittled away by the oncoming modern day and the pushing in of the world in upon our hearts and lives. Well, we need to get back to the old paths. And then we saw the valley gate, and we suggested that the valley gate speaks to our hearts of the fact that we are to walk not only through the valley of the shadow of death, for we believe it suggests that, but also it's the present walk of the believer today in humbleness. And certainly that's needed today, and especially by those who profess to be fundamental in the faith. Then the last gate we looked at was the gate we don't mention very often. That's the dung gate. The gate out of which at night the filth of the city of Jerusalem was carried. It was the most important gate to the health and the sanitation and the welfare of that city of Jerusalem. And that is something that we saw that's needed in the heart of the believer because we have that gate today and it swings on the hinge if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In verse 15, we come to the sixth gate, and there are ten of these gates. You see these gates are singing out a hymn of praise. These gates are saying, if you please, that uh, the King of Glory wants to come in. These gates are, sa are saying to you and me that this is a gospel story. And it's an instrument of ten strings, for there are ten gates here. Now, this sixth gate in verse 15, and let me read part of the verse, but the gate of the fountain repaired Shalan, the son of Colhose. Now, may I say to you that the gate of the fountain, I think, speaks very definitely to us of the Holy Spirit, which has been given to every believer. You remember when the Lord Jesus met this woman at the well, and the Lord told her as he attempted to get her thinking away from that well, he told her about a fountain. He said that if you had only known, you would have asked drink of me, and I would have given you to drink out of a fountain, not just a well filled with, with stale water, but I would give you to drink of living water. Well, that woman actually is very much puzzled. All she can say is, I sure would like to have that water. And immediately her thinking drops back to the bottom of the well. She says, because I wouldn't have to come here and draw water anymore. And again, he lifted her thinking out of the bottom of that well to living waters and told her that that which he was talking about was wells, not just wells, but fountains of living waters that would come from within. Now, what he was speaking of was the Holy Spirit, because you will recall that again when he was in Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles, when they poured out, as they did at that feast, the water around the altar, he at that time said, not only he that believeth in me out of his inmost being shall flow rivers of living water, but he said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. 
And then John explains to us that the thing he was speaking of was the Holy Spirit. For John says at this time the Holy Spirit was not yet given. And we find that on the day of Pentecost the Holy Spirit came. That's never been repeated. And when any person accepts the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes within him to indwell him. That's the one that our Lord says that out of his inmost being shall flow rivers of living water. And, and Paul enforced it by saying, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. You don't even belong to Christ unless you are indwelt by the Spirit. Now somebody says, as many Christians do, well, I do know that I have accepted Christ as my Savior. And I do know that years ago when I first took him as my Savior, I had a joy in my heart. And I'm confident at that time that it could be said, out of my inmost being there did flow living water. But I want to tell you that as I've gone along, and I, I get letters like this all the time, and they read very much like I'm speaking right now. As I've gone along in the Christian faith and hardships have come to me and I've had to face problems and I've met temptations and I've succumbed oftentimes, I want to say that I sometimes wonder. I, I sometimes wonder whether I'm a Christian at all because I want to say that out of my inmost being there's no fountain flowing. I don't know what it is to have that kind of experience in my life and I do not experience that at all. May I say to you, a believer, every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Paul said to the carnal Corinthians, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But believers are either living with a grieved or an ungrieved Holy Spirit. You can grieve the Spirit of God. And since he's a person, the same thing happens when you grieve him that when you grieve anyone else. Your fellowship is broken. No longer is that sweet relationship. No longer is that flow of communication. And by sin in your life, and so many of these people, just, just a dead giveaway, they say, well, I've had... Uh, as one lady said the other day, said, I married an unsaved man and we've had these troubles and I must confess that I've gone along with him at times and, and I want to say today that I'm far from God. Yes, that's the same story. You're living with a grieved Holy Spirit. She said, I'm confident years ago that I accepted Christ as my Savior. Yes, you did. You're a born-again child of God, but you're dwelling with a grieved Holy Spirit. You grieved him. Sin in the life grieves the Holy Spirit, and no longer is there a flowing fountain of living water that's going out from the life, but actually there is that staleness in the life and actually bitterness that has come to the inside. Instead of being a blessing to others, we're no longer a blessing to others. In fact, we are a hindrance today. My beloved, are you living with a grieved or an ungrieved Holy Spirit? Is the Spirit of God grieved in your life if you're his child? Well, may I say to you, why go on like that? Why go on living with the, with the Holy Spirit grieved in your life, no longer power, no longer the flowing of living waters, when he has said that he wants each believer to be a fountain? Every now and then you meet a believer that, like that, don't you? You meet a Christian that's just bubbling up all the time, uh, just effervescent, and uh, always a blessing and a joy. And then you meet another one. And believe me, you think they've been weaned on a dill pickle. My, how bitter and sour they are on life. They are no blessing to people at all and no blessing to anyone at all. What is the difficulty? What's the difference? Well, the difference is just simply this. I don't question but what the Dale Pickle person is a, is a child of God. I just say that person's living with a grieved Holy Spirit, and there's no bubbling up of living water in the life and in the heart. That is the gate of the fountain, if you please. 
Now, that's verse 15. And I have to go way down in this chapter. Fact of the matter is, I have to go all the way to verse 26 to find the next gate. And let me read verse 26 to you. Moreover, the Nathanims dwelt in Ophel, under the place over against the water gate toward the east and the tower that lieth out. Now, the interesting thing is that concerning all nine of the gates, there is a reference made to the fact that the gate was repaired. But there is no reference made here at all to the water gate that it was repaired because it didn't need repair. It's interesting that when Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed Jerusalem, that he, uh, he leveled the city almost. He didn't do quite the job that Titus did later on. The Lord Jesus, you remember, said not one stone will be left on another. And Titus didn't leave one stone on another. But Nebuchadnezzar did. He leveled the city, but he apparently left one gate. And isn't it interesting? It happened to be the water gate. Now, what does the water gate speak to, us, speak to us of? That the water gate speaks to us of the Word of God. And the very interesting thing is that when this man, Nehemiah, conducted the greatest Bible reading that actually Ezra did the reading, but Nehemiah is the one that called them together for it, a layman, if you please. Well, how we need laymen like that today. How we need laymen that will become concerned and interested in the reading and the study of the Word of God. Well, this great company came together, and we're told that a pulpit, and it's the only time you find the word pulpit mentioned here in Scripture, and a pulpit was put up at the water gate, and there's where they read the Word of God. Well, the water speaks of the Word of God. The interesting thing is, we're told, now ye're clean, the Lord Jesus said to his own, now ye're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And then when he prayed, he said this, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now, two things will you note. First of all, this gate did not need repairing. And the second thing is that there is sanctifying power in the Word of God, cleansing power, if you please. First of all, this gate did not need repairing. And today, my beloved, that speaks of the Word of God, and here is a book that does not need repairing. It doesn't need any assistance from you or me. Now, when I entered the ministry, I went to a seminary in my denomination where the emphasis was upon apologetics. That is a defense of the Word of God. And I went to seminary with this in mind. This is the way I went, and it's the way I graduated. I was going to learn every argument there was against the Word of God and get the answer. When I got them all together, I was going to start out. I was going down the line, and I'd come to you, and I'd say, Brother, what's your trouble? Why don't you believe the Bible? And you'd say, well, the reason I don't believe the Bible is I'm having trouble with Noah. I don't like that store Noah and all that business of building an ark. And I would say, well, now let's see, that's, oh yeah, that's number 67. I have the answer for you, brother. Here it is, number 67, and here's your answer. Then I'd give it to him, bowl him over. And then I'd say, now do you believe you? And uh, then I'd come over here and I'd say, what's your difficulty? And you'd say, well, you know, I'd be honest with you, that story of Jonah, I have trouble with Jonah. Just can't believe that story of that fish tall. And I'd say, well, now that's, that's 24. Here's your answer. And I'd say to him, do you believe now? Well, I started out that way, and you know what I found out? All I did was make this fellow so, and I made that fellow so. Do you know that no person wants to be whipped down intellectually? That is one thing, especially in this day, that people just don't want to be shown up 
intellectually. We're living in a day when the emphasis is upon the intellectual. And as a result, if you really want to make people antagonistic, you win the argument. You may win the argument, but you lose the people. Because after all, uh, really and truly, I have found this to be true, and I can give you quotations from a dozen men who've had lots more experience than I have and whose experience is more vast than mine could possibly be, and it's simply this, that the problem of most people is not intellectual. The problem is not in the mind. It's down here in the heart. They are sinners. And when I hear some fellow blowing off about he doesn't believe this in the Bible and he can't accept that, I just wonder what he's hiding in his life. What is he covering up that this book has opened up? What is it that this book is condemning? May I say to you, this book does not need defending at all. It's like Dr. Bob Shuler used to say when he was pastor down here at the Trinity Methodist Church. He says, you know, you never put a guard at a lion cage. When the circus comes to town, you do not put a guard at the lion cage to protect the lion from the pussycats in the neighborhood. May I say to you, you don't need a guard there. All you have to do is just turn that lion loose, and he'll take care of himself. And may I say to you, this book, I have learned, does not need my apologetic preaching. I wish you folk could hear some of the sermons I've got on apologetics. I'd bowl you over with them. But they're unanswerable. I think there's several unanswerable arguments to this book. But I found out, my beloved, that that's not our problem. Our problem is not that. This book needs to be turned loose today. And if it's turned loose, it'll do a job. And if you will read it, that's one reason we're trying to get many of you to the book. If you get to this book and begin to read this book, you will find out that the Lord Jesus' prayer will be answered for you. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And you read this book, and before long, instead of you sitting in judgment on it and having trouble with Noah and Jonah, you're going to find out that this book's been having trouble with you. And you're going to find out the difficulties with you. And you're going to find out that this book begins to throw light upon your own heart and your own need. And before long, it'll begin to clean you up and straighten you out. This book has that power. I believe this is a supernatural book. And it doesn't need my defense at all. I believe this book will take care of itself. God's Word. He's well able to take care of it. The trouble is that Christians need to loose it, let it run, and have free course. And if you'll do that, and I challenge you, you're not reading this book, you join with us. You'd be amazed the number of people that have come to me privately. I had a family not long ago that said, when we began that, we thought we were Christians. We found out we were not. This book will throw light on you. My beloved, it'll bring you to this wonderful state. And how we need the water gate. And how many of us need to go down yonder to that water gate. And draw water. Draw water out of this well. It will not only slack our thirst. It'll cleanse our hearts. It'll cleanse our lives as nothing else will. Let's move on to the next gate that we have here. And the, the eighth gate that is mentioned is in verse 28. From above the horse gate repaired the priests, everyone over against his house. The horse gate. Now the horse in Scripture is the animal that depicts war as the little donkey depicts peace. You see, when our Lord rode into Jerusalem that day on this little donkey, 
The, the, his very action was symbolic. To begin with, he was riding on the animal that kings would ride upon. Ambassadors, men of high position, rode on that little animal because it was a little animal that set forth peace. But the horse set forth war. And the horse gate speaks to us of warfare. For the child of God, there is warfare. And that warfare, my beloved, is something that's very real. For the very moment that you take Christ as your Savior, you move over on God's side, and immediately Satan and all his hosts become your enemy. And if you think for one moment he's not going to fight you, you're wrong. If you think that somehow or another he's carrying on a cold war, you're wrong. He's carrying on the hottest one you can imagine. And he'll make an attack upon those that are God's foe. And that's the reason that Paul wrote to the Ephesians after he told them about their wonderful position up yonder in the heavenlies. Now he said, let's get back to earth. Let's get back to that which is rock bottom material. I want to tell you now, you put on the whole armor of God. For we are not warring against flesh and blood but we are warring against principalities and powers. We are warring against spiritual foes. And you need the whole armor of God. My friend, we need to go over that passage of Scripture and put on that armor today, because whether you like it or not, you're in a fight. But the devil's not ready to make peace with you. He'll give you trouble as long as you stay in this life. You may be sure of that. He is your enemy if you're God's child. Let me move on to the next gate, the ninth gate. And we have it mentioned here in verse 29. After them repaired Zadok, the son of Emmer, over against his house. After him repaired also Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate. <clears throat> I love this gate. This gate and the next one. Wonderful gate. And the east gate... You know what side of Jerusalem it was on? The east side. It's the east gate, you see. It's on the east side. You can talk about east side, west side, all around the town. This was east side. This was east side. And it was on the east side. You know why it was called the east gate? It was the first gate opened every morning. It was the gate toward the sunrise. And all during the long, dark night, the watchman went up and down the wall. He called off the watches. That was the change of the watches. And then in the morning, when there was the first ray of light over in the east, people came out. And uh, many people that maybe hadn't been able to sleep disturbed during the night. And they look up and they say, watchman, what of the night? Down here in this walled city, it seems so dark, isn't it ever going to become day? The watchman from the wall says, the morning coming. I see a glimmer of light way out yonder to the east. Then there's a movement in the city as it begins to get up. And then the watchman calls down, open the east gate. I can now see the horizon and there's no enemy in sight. Open the east gate and let the sun in. And they opened the east gate. And the first ray of the sun came in through the east gate. What a picture. Now may I say to you, the east gate in the ancient city was the gate that was open first of the morning. That's when you knew that the sun was coming up. It was when that gate, when you heard it begin to squeak on its hinges, people said, well, the sun's coming up. We can't see it in the city yet. But the sun is coming up. May I say to you that God's people today are gathered at the east gate. And I must confess to you, it's dark down here where we are now. I do not know how close it is. But I do know this, that the Lord Jesus, the last word he gave to us is this, I am the bright and morning star. When the Old Testament closes, we are told the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. 
A bright morning star always comes up before the sun comes up. And to the church, he's the bright morning star. To the world, he'll be the son of righteousness and to the nation Israel. But we're looking, we're waiting for that bright morning star. I remember going over it several years ago on the chief on the Santa Fe, and it used to get over there in Arizona early of the morning. And I waked up early that morning. Generally can sleep pretty well on the train, but I waked up early. And, oh, what a, what a, a wonderful horizon. Oh, it was just like fire out yonder in the east. And uh, I lifted up the shade, and I lay there and watched it. And all of a sudden, I came up. A, not the sun, a star. It was Venus, because Venus is generally the morning star as well as the evening star at certain times. And that was the bright and morning star. And I thought, my, how, how beautiful, how wonderful that is. And the minute that that star appeared, I knew the sun would be up in a few minutes. And I don't think it was over 15 or 20 minutes till here came the sun. One of these days, God's people are gathered at the east gate. The bright and morning star shall appear. Paul says that those that are his own are to be caught up to meet him in the air. And may I say to you then the gate. The east gate is thrown open. Open wide, ye gates. Be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, because he's coming back. He's coming in. And he'll come to this earth to establish his kingdom after he takes those that are his own out of this world. I love that east gate, if you please. And then the next gate belongs to it, and that is the tenth gate. Will you notice what is said here concerning this gate in verse 31? After him repaired Malchiah, the goldsmith's son, unto the place of the Nathanims and of the merchants over against the gate Mifkad and to the going up of the corner. Now, Mifkad is the name of the tenth gate. Somebody says, well, I've been with you up to this gate. What in the world does Mifkad mean? I wish they had translated this word Mifkad. The reason they didn't is because it can mean two things and does. It means registry, and it means review. This is the gate where every stranger who came into Jerusalem, he had to come through this gate, and he had to sign up. He had to, uh, he had to indicate who he was, what his business was in Jerusalem. And then the other thing was it was the gate that was the re gate of review. It's where, for instance, David went when his soldiers went out to war and they came back victorious. David would go to this gate and watch them march in. And as they came in, here is this old veteran of, of David's. He's all wounded and his hand is bound up. And David stops the whole arm and said, here, tell him to come out. And they bring him out and they say to him, David says, I've heard about you. I heard about how you fought in the battle and fought for the nation and fought for me, the king, and I, I want to reward you. I want to give you your decoration right here and now. And he rewards that one. May I say to you that when the Lord Jesus comes and takes those that are his own out of this world, we'll all meet him, I think, yonder at the gate Mifkad. For there's where he's to reward those that are his, those that have been faithful down here. This has nothing in the world to do with salvation. It does have to do with your works down here, how faithful you've been to him, what you've endured for him, what you've gone through for him. It has to do with your life down here because he's noting every moment of it. He's noting everything that you do. He's recording it in order in that day that he might give recognition to those that are his own, the gate Mifkad. That's the tenth gate. Somebody says that's the last gate, isn't it? No. I close with verse 32, the last verse of the chapter. And between the going up of the corner under the sheep gate repaired the goldsmiths and the merchants. 
the goldsmiths and the merchants repaired up to the sheep gate. Well, wait a minute. Didn't we start off with the sheep gate? Yes. Well, we're back at the sheep gate. That means we've been around the walls of Jerusalem. The sheep gate speaks of the cross of Christ. We started at the cross of Christ. We end at the cross of Christ. And everything is done in the light and in sight of that gate. But that's the important one. The gate that the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world entered. Went out in judgment to bear your judgment death and bear your guilt and my guilt upon the cross in order that you and I might have life and light. And when we come to that gate, then may I say all these other gates are open to us. But until we come to the sheep gate, every other gate is barred to us. Every other gate is meaningless. Not until you and I come to the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. I say again, have you been through the sheep gate? Have you come to Christ as saved? Have you come as a sinner to him to accept what he did for you on the cross when he bore all your guilt, all your shame, all your curse, in order that you might have life? And maybe you've been trying to begin with God somewhere else. You've been trying to get in another gate. The Lord Jesus says, if any man comes in any other way, the same as a thief and a robber. He says, I'm the doer. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. The way in is through the sheep gate, through Christ. Any other way, you can't come to him by good works until after you've accepted him as Savior. Then he'll talk to you about your good works. Somebody says, I want to witness for him. You can't witness for him until you have first come in the door where he's the door and you take him as saved. None of these others are open to us until we come to him. Have you come to the sheep gate? Have you come to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? He wants to cleanse you from the sin in your life. He wants to remove the burden of that sin that weighs you down. He stretched out his arms, offering you the gift of salvation, waiting for you to take it. Do that today. Receive the gift of his salvation. To receive more information on God's plan of salvation for your life, call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE anytime and leave a voicemail request for our salvation packet. And when you do call, be sure to include your name, address, and the call letters of this station. Today's sermon, The Gospel in the Gates of Jerusalem, is available on a single CD. It can be ordered by calling one of our service operators at 1-800-652-4253, Monday through Thursday, from 6 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Pacific Time. For those of you who have access to the Internet, you can take the opportunity to hear this broadcast again. You can even listen to the last year of this program, the question and answer broadcast, and, of course, our weekday through the Bible program. To find us on the web, you can go to ttb.org. Our website also, by the way, includes an updated radio log, our online bookstore, and a brief history of this ministry. So join us on the web. Again, the address is ttb.org. This week on the Through the Bible radio program, you'll hear Dr. McGee's wit and wisdom in his continuing study in the book of Nehemiah. So if you'd like to be added to the mailing list for notes and outlines and our monthly newsletter, you can do so when you call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE anytime. You can also contact us via the Internet by using our order form or downloading those notes and outlines from our website at ttb.org. And remember, you can always write to Sunday Sermon via the Postal Service. In the U.S., Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Now we pray that our God will fill you with His grace, mercy, and peace every moment of every day. This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of Through the Bible Radio Network.